Hello and welcome everyone to the second in our current briefing series. This one is going to be talking all things dynamic containment. I'm Alice Grundy, I'm a reporter for Current and I will be your host today. I'm joined by Mike Ryan, who is the UK Commercial Director at Habitat Energy. Those of you who don't know, Habitat Energy is an optimization and energy trading firm focused predominantly on battery storage. Its trading platform combines algorithmic forecasting and AI to maximize asset performance and value for over 200 megawatt hours of storage in the UK. How today is going to work is that Mike will give a 10, 15 minute presentation and then we'll open up for questions. So feel free to pop any questions you think of during the presentation or Q&A into the chat or questions tab on the right hand side of the screen. But that, I think that's kind of all the quick introductions out the way and I know everyone's probably quite keen to dive into the, the meat of dynamic containment. So Mike, if you're ready, I'll bring your presentation up and you can take it away. Thank you. So welcome everybody. Great to be here and discussing dynamic containment. Uh, as mentioned, Mike Ryan, UK Commercial Director for Habitat Energy. So ultimately responsible for making sure that we earn the right amount of revenue for our clients' assets. So Habitat Energy, we're an optimizer of storage assets and solar plus storage and various associated technologies. Um, currently, have around 230 megawatt hours of contracted assets under management, um, including the world's largest hybrid battery right here in Oxford, just right down the road from where I'm sat. Um, pleased to say we're the top op um, optimizer on LCPs and ACT leaderboard, and particularly pertinent to today's conversation, the largest provider of DC volume to National Grid and the largest provider of um, balancing volume stacked on top of DC volume to National Grid. Um, a little bit of background for myself before I start. Um, prior to Habitat, I worked for Inesco, optimizing their 100 megawatt storage portfolio, the largest in the country at the time. And before that, worked for the system operator for over a decade. So I've been around batteries, ancillary services, and dynamic containment for quite a while now. And it is uh, it's great to see it finally go live and be running assets that are participating in it. But let's get into the meat of it and let's focus on dynamic containment. So what is dynamic containment? Well, we've got to think about this more than just dynamic containment. Dynamic containment is a frequency response service, and it's one of three new services that National Grid is launching. And just very quickly, what is response? I'm sure everybody here will be aware of it. But response services are a change in active power that occurs automatically based on locally measured frequency. So a way for assets to automatically help support the national grid, maintain it operating at that 50 Hertz frequency and be commercially compensated for doing so. So why the three new services? Well, for the vast majority of time, frequency responses come in the form of um, FFR or MFR, MFR being the mandatory version of frequency response. FFR being the commercial version that many people will be familiar with and have tended in for over the years. But those services were designed for a different system. They were designed when the system was one that had high levels of inertia, that had many CCGTs and coal-fired power stations connected to it, and where the largest loss on the system was really limited to the nuclear power stations we had. The system's changed dramatically. It is no longer a high inertia system. In fact, there are periods of time when it is an incredibly low inertia system. What does that mean? Well, it means frequency moves faster when it does move. If you have any given event occur on the network, you can find yourself running away from 50 hertz very quickly, often described as rock off your rate of change of frequency. We also have fewer CCGTs and coal-fired power stations on the system. The FFR, um, uh, response was designed for traditional technology and therefore designed around the limitations of traditional tech. It wasn't really designed around the system need, it was designed around what could the assets that were connected to the system at that time deliver. So if we're going to design a new service, how do you go about doing it? Well, the first thing is to think about what is the system need? What do we actually need this service to do? We need it to maintain frequency basically within two levels. We want it to maintain the frequency within National Grid's operational limits. So operational limits are the day-to-day -day limits National Grid lets the frequency deviate between. 
and we want to ensure it is maintained within statutory limits, so the legal limits that National Grid is obliged to keep the frequency within it. The reason for the difference is if you know you have a legal limit to keep the frequency above, say, 49.5 hertz, you need to know what level should you operate it to day to day so that for a large loss on the system, you're not going to break that limit. So hence, National Grid will keep it above 49.8 because they know if it is at 49.8 and you lose the largest asset on the system, you're not going to go outside of 49.5. So you want to design your new products around that. You also want to design them so they can take advantage of the new technology that's out there. Now, the big change in technology has really been the introduction of fast responding assets, primarily batteries and primarily lithium ion. That's allowed National Grid to design a product that can operate sub-second. This first happened with the launch of EFR, the Enhanced Frequency Response Service, when that came out. And that was always seen as a bit of a pilot, a bit of a trial of this new product for National Grid to get some learning as to how that affected system dynamics, and then go on to design a new suite of products that could take advantage of this. And that's why we've seen Dynamic Containment, the first of these new faster acting services to come out has some similarities with EFR, but is definitely not the same. So you can see on the table there, the three services that are here are dynamic containment, operating sub-second, dynamic moderation, also operating sub-second, and dynamic regulation, which looks a lot more akin to the traditional FFR service. And from the graph, you can see how those services are designed to keep the frequency within that operational and statutory limits. Some key differences to the traditional services are the delivery ranges, dynamic containment just operating between 0.2 and 0.5 hertz, bar a small amount of delivery that's given at lower frequency deviations than that, and dynamic moderation and regulation being out to 0.2 hertz deviation. The other big difference is the performance monitoring that's required for these services. You're required to provide data to National Grid at 20 hertz granularity. That's quite high levels of granularity, by no means impossible, we've seen from the number of assets that are in DC. But initially, I would uh, posit for some providers, seemed a bit of a stretch from what they used to be given. Why do you need to provide it at that level of granularity? Well, it's because of the speed of response National Grid requires. If they need your assets to respond very quickly, you have to be able to demonstrate that they're actually doing what you say they're doing, that you are delivering the service you're being paid for. And then the other change is this concept of um, duration limited assets. So if you're bidding into these services with a storage asset, an asset that is inherently duration limited, it can't continue providing the service necessarily indefinitely. Well, what is the minimum duration that's required to be able to deliver in these services? So at the moment, we know for dynamic containment, it's 15 minutes, dynamic moderation and dynamic regulation. National Grid's current view is that those will be 30 minutes and 60 minutes. I should add, for moderation and regulation, conversations are still going on with National Grid to fully define these services, but that's where their minded two position is at right now. And then finally, I'll just mention the size of the markets for these products. So dynamic containment, the largest market up to 1400 megawatts is the max size National Grid are envisaging at the moment. Dynamic moderation, significantly smaller, down at 500 megawatts maximum, and dynamic regulation down at 600 megawatts. I think one of the key things to take away here is that in total, the response market is about two and a half gigawatts in size. And that is likely to be it. It may increase and change slightly over time, but there's not going to be some doubling of the size of the response market year in, year out. The size of the response market is a function of the physical characteristics of the system itself. And it should always be seen as a relatively shallow market that's used to top up on the revenue you earn rather than the underlying revenue stream in your business case. So if we move on and thinking more about dynamic containment specifically, what's happened over the last few months that the dynamic containment has been live, and um, what do we here at Habitat envisage happening as we go forwards? So some of these charts that I'll show may seem um, a little bit busy, but obviously you'll have access to these charts later to look through. And we're just trying to get over some of the complexity here surrounding these markets. So you can see there on the yellow line, the volume of eligible batteries in megawatts for 
dyna um, dynamic containment or potentially uh, dynamic moderation when that launches. And up until today's date, we've used the actual accepted volume that um, has been in national grids tenders. And you've seen how there has been a steady increase in the volume of megawatts participating in dynamic containment. The green dashed line shows the maximum size of the dynamic containment market that National Grid has published. So you, you can see that right now we're some way below that maximum dynamic containment size. But it is not long before the volume of eligible batteries installed on the system starts hitting that market cap. And then we would expect true competitive pressure to come into the dynamic containment market. The forward curve for installed battery megawatts comes from a combination of conversations um, we have with people around their views of how the market is growing, but also the Bayes Renewable Energy Planning database, which provides a view on the volume of assets that are going to be built out over the next few months. I think it's also worth noting that come the end of 2022 or even Q3 2022, the volume of installed batteries actually outstrips the entire frequency response market at that point. So then you would expect to see those commercial pressures fall on all response services. So it's not that DM and DR coming online early next year are suddenly going to add a massive boost to revenue streams and that's going to endure indefinitely. All it's doing is pushing out slightly the point at which the supply of eligible assets outweighs the demand of frequency response from National Grid. So what does that mean for pricing? Clearly pricing is a function of supply and demand. And if we can plot a few of these elements on a graph, we can start to get a view of what we would expect people to do when they're pricing into these services and therefore what we would expect National Grid to have to pay based not just on supply and demand dynamics, but also on the opportunity cost. So if I'm putting my asset into dynamic containment, it means I can't deliver merchant services or I'm only able to stack an element of BM services on top of it. So I need to weigh up the choice between providing merchant services and earning merchant revenue or providing dynamic containment and earning dynamic containment revenue. So on here in the green line, we've got the dynamic containment price. You can see to date, it's been at this 17 pound, basically an artificial cap. National Grid have described it as the cost of the alternative to procuring dynamic containment, um, though suspiciously flat at 17 pounds all days, all time. The dashed blue line, I think is interesting. This is the merchant opportunity cost. So for dates prior to today, how much could you have earned if you were trading your asset in merchant markets? And you can see over the last winter, there have been several periods where you could earn significantly more from trading your asset in merchant markets than you could in dynamic containment. Now, for me, that is key. If you really want to maximize the value you're earning out of your asset, you have to be able to not just forecast when those events are going to occur, but then move into a merchant market and capture that forecast revenue. Um, it's something we did on approximately 30 occasions over the last winter to great success. If you look at the dash blue line going forward, you'll see that huge amount of volatility we have in our actual data from history um, isn't shown in the graph going forwards. Uh, that's because we've used a, an average of several years um, uh, historic data to form a view of what the market price could look like um, going forwards. Uh, clearly, if you want our actual in-house view, you um, will have to sign a contract with us or pay me some money and we'll be willing to share that. So for here, we've just gone for um, an average. But even then, you can see that in this winter coming, there are periods when that dash blue line, the merchant value outweighs the, the dynamic containment revenue that you can earn. Even whilst if you sort of January, February time, dynamic containment price is still at 17 pound. Come the end of the year, though, the beginning of next year, the volume bidding into DC outweighs the demand of DC on National Grid's part. And that's when we expect to see those prices decrease. Because it's a daily auction, if you bid in one day and you're rejected because your price is too high, you have an opportunity the very next day to bid back in and reduce your price. Because it's such a quick turnaround, 
we anticipate that those prices, when they do start to decrease, will decrease very rapidly as people are determined to try and earn some of that dynamic containment revenue. We expect it to fall to a level similar to the current level of FFR prices, because whilst the supply outweighs the demand for dynamic containment, as you may recall from that previous slide, it is still lower than the total frequency response requirement that National Grid has. So people will be placing their assets in a combination of dynamic containment, um, traditional FFR, and merchant revenue streams. The graph becomes a bit complex once DM and DR launch because again you're suddenly increasing the demand on National Grid's side. Battery supply is increasing but there's a period where National Grid's demand outweighs the supply but again that falls away and as soon as we get to that sort of Q3 2022 period where total battery supply outweighs total response demand, then we would expect to see prices track very closely the merchant opportunity cost. And you can see how the prices we have there for DM, for DR, um, and for DC all suddenly become very volatile as they are just tracking that merchant opportunity cost. So let's zoom in, in a little bit onto that. Um, just one section and say, well, what does pricing look like when you're in that world? So dynamic containment has a lower degradation than merchant generally. Reason being in dynamic containment, the battery is only cycling maybe 0.2 to half a cycle a day. Whereas to earn your merchant revenue, you're probably cycling between one and a half and two and a half cycles a day doesn't mean it's necessarily the wrong thing to do to go into merchant. You just need to ensure that the value you're earning from merchant outweighs the degradation you're causing on the asset, something we at Habitat do dynamically within every trading decision we make. Because of that, though, you would expect dynamic containment prices to be somewhat lower than the merchant opportunity cost. Um, conversely, for something like DM and DR, particularly DR, which has relatively high cycling levels, potentially between three and five cycles a day, you would expect the cost the, um, the cost for a battery to deliver that service to be significantly higher than the merchant cost. This brings up an interesting point where it's potentially true that DHAR has such high cycling requirements um, that the price at which uh, a battery asset would bid in um, would just be unattractive to National Grid compared to perhaps a more traditional asset or it is true to say um, a battery of a different technology. This is an area where perhaps vanadium flow batteries might really succeed because of their you know, low to zero um, degradation costs. To be able to calculate your merchant opportunity cost like this on a daily basis, factor in your cycling for merchant versus the cycling for dynamic containment or dynamic moderation, and then knowing how to bid in is highly complex. Um, it requires very intelligent algorithms, highly accurate forecasts, and the ability to be incredibly dynamic. And everything I've shown here is assuming daily contracts. Come the end of August, we expect this to go to EFA block. So actually, you'll be tendering in for six periods every single day. And you will want to know, well, what's the opportunity cost of just one of those EFA blocks? This can be even more complex for a battery asset to do, given that in one EFA block you may be charging and in another EFA block you may be discharging. So you're trying to work out the opportunity cost of only being able to perform one half of your arbitrage. It's not simple, but it can be done. You just have to consider the complexity here, make sure you understand it, and make sure you're therefore bidding in accurately to these services. As this becomes more complex, as the services become more granular, as your pricing strategy becomes more sophisticated, you want to make sure that you are still maximizing the revenue that you're earning on your asset. A further way you can do this, and we are currently doing it, is by making sure you're appropriately stacking services. So today, we stack merchant with dynamic containment with BM. Dynamic containment is currently a low frequency service only. When it opens up to high frequency, you'll be wanting to do the same stacking in both directions. 
so stacking those low frequency services. When dynamic moderation comes in, you'll want to be thinking about how do you stack dynamic moderation with dynamic containment with merchant with BN and thinking about how you do it on the low frequency side. And going back to my previous point, thinking about how you do all of this and run all of these calculations for every EFA block of every day, 365 days a year. It becomes complex, but there is an awful lot of opportunity here. It's not that merchant will always outweigh dynamic containment and dynamic moderation, nor is it that those response services will always outweigh merchant. But we do believe that it's that frequency response services prices will trend towards the merchant opportunity cost. And I'll just wrap up with a final few points here. It's absolutely our view that the DC market is likely to saturate within the next six to 12 months, and that will cause prices to come down. I think it's well worth remembering that National Grid has a legal obligation to operate the system, yes, safely, yes, securely, but above all, economically. Anything National Grid does, it's doing to try and reduce the cost of operating a safe system. Now, that might mean overall spend goes up slightly, but they're always introducing products and services that bring down the cost than would otherwise have been the case had they left things where they were. After saturation, it's highly likely, assuming rational bidding behavior, that frequency response services should track the merchant opportunity cost. What do I mean by rational bidding behavior? Well, we've seen be people bid in um, at, as price takers, um, but I would say beyond just price takers, bidding in at levels of sort of a penny, which is below your cost of delivery and doesn't really make any economic sense to bid in at that level. But assuming rational economic behavior, we would expect prices to track merchant opportunity cost. Participating in these markets becomes ever more complex and requires greater and greater levels of sophistication. And to be able to do it, you require much more active management and an active trading strategy. Thank you. And I think now we're moving on to a Q&A. We are. Thanks, Mike. That was excellent. We've had quite a few number of questions in, so I'll um, pick some out. And again, if there's any that you are particularly keen to answer, we'll jump to those as well. We've had one from Phil Jeffrey, who says that he's interested to hear your view on the commercial value in pounds per megawatt per year for DM and DR, both the rollout and in the first three years. Find the mute button. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I was just reading Phil's question there. Um, yeah. uh, so is the, was it the view on DR prices seems opt optimistic? Uh, no, it's the one on um, your view on the commercial value in terms of kind of pounds per megawatt per year for DM and DR, both at their initial rollout and in the first three years. Uh, so it I just put yep. to start, so we might have to take a second to find it. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I've just, just found it now. Perfect. Um, so firstly, I think we should separate two things here. There's commercial value for the provider and then there's commercial value to National Grid. So lots of people talk about these services having great value to National Grid. Um, yes, DC, um, a very fast responding service. So there's a sense that it's very valuable to National Grid. Um, that is true. It means they require a lot less response. However, the price, the value to a provider, is all going to come down to those demand supply um, uh, fundamentals. And if there are lots of people bidding into it and it is an oversupplied auction, you would expect to see the price um, drop quite drastically. Um, and so the value to provider trend towards that merchant opportunity cost. Um, in terms of uh, DM and DR, DM we would expect to, um, to follow the same pattern. Uh, DR is an interesting one. Now, um, it, Interestingly, or interestingly for me, we had a bit of a conversation before presenting these slides around whether or not we include DR on this. Um, I think it's highly unlikely that most batteries will participate in DR. Um, as you can see from the prices we put on there, the prices that batteries would need to bid in at to make DR a viable option for them means it's highly likely that they will just be rejected. I expect there being other, to be other providers who can just massively undercut that, particularly because it's a product they can sit there and provide all day long. Um, so you know, probably more akin to uh, FFR prices we saw back in 2018. Brilliant. We've um, had another one. This was going to ask quite at the start from uh, Marit Kubik, which is, and again, you, you did touch on this briefly, but um, mm -hmm. how similar will dynamic moderation, dynamic regulation be to 
dynamic containment and will they be more or less challenging to deliver or about the same? Um, so dynamic moderation I would see as being very similar other than setting your trigger levels at a different point so your um, your frequency trigger levels at a different point um, the requirements are relatively similar um, again you have the same 20 Hertz performance metering requirement which is seems to have been the one that where people have struggled to get into dynamic containment it seems to have been around that issue rather than the batteries being able to actually respond fast enough i mean many of us know batteries can respond even quicker if needed um there are interesting arguments around why even quicker isn't needed at this point in time um dy dynamic regulation i don't see that as being a difficult service um for people to provide i would see that as being less challenging unless they change the rules around how you have to prove that your duration limited asset um, is able to provide this service continuously. Again, National Grid is still discussing that um, and whether it follows the same format as DM and DC, having to maintain a certain uh, level of state of charge or state of energy as National Grid call it through a baselining process um, or whether they go through um, some other mechanism to do that. I think we will have to wait and see. Um, so in summary, DC and DM I see as being the same, DR I would see as being uh, quite a bit easier bar the performance monitoring. We've had one from uh, Thomas McIver who says, can an asset participate in DC, DM and DR simultaneously? So National Grid have always stated very keen to make these services stackable. I think people just need to be conscious of what stackable means. If you have a 50 megawatt asset and you're going to bid it into these services, it is highly unlikely that asset can do 50 megawatts of DC, 50 megawatts of DM, and 50 megawatts of DR. You're getting paid three times for the same megawatt doing three different things. It can't, it can only do one thing at a time. So in terms of having them stackable, what it will probably be is that you will be able to do X megawatts of DM, Y megawatts of DR, Z megawatts of DC, and X, Y, and Z will add to 50 megawatts. And it's up to you how you separate that out. So stackable in that one asset could do all of the services simultaneously, um, but not stackable in terms of you can have one megawatt of active power delivering multiple active power services at the same time. That makes a lot of sense. Um, moving on to, we've got so many questions in. Um, one from Caroline Marriage who says, what do you see the impact of EFA block purchasing rather than EFA day being on DC procurement? Um, my anticipation is that a lot of providers actually will stick to a, a flat price or a relatively unsophisticated pricing strategy where they might say, well, I'll value the peak high um, and I'll you know, value the trough slow and um, the overnight minimum, not at all. As I mentioned earlier, the pricing strategy needs to be more complex than that, more sophisticated than that, because you need to be aware that you could be getting your asset accepted for one EFA block um, which represents one half of your arbitrage, your pair of arbitrage legs. Um, so uh, I'd, I'd like to share more, but I feel I'm then starting to tell you a bit about our secret source around how we're thinking about pricing that. Um, I it, it will evolve over time. I expect to see most providers doing a fairly simplistic strategy to start with, um, but because the pricing um, for these auctions is so public, as soon as somebody uh, has a good idea, you very quickly see others follow. Absolutely, and I wouldn't ask you to offer up any trade secrets. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've had a question from Paul Soskin who says, what was the thinking about the market size for DC, DM and DR in a world with more renewables? Do you envision National Grid ESO increasing the market size? Okay, so um, market size comes down entirely to system need. So it is, how much of these products do we need to meet our legal, our statutory obligations of um, where frequency needs to remain? So that's where the size comes from. So then in terms of how's that gonna grow, will you look at what changes the requirement, um, how you meet that system need? And there's a couple of things that push your requirement up and a couple of things that push your requirement down. So what pu could push the market size up? Decreasing levels of inertia could push the size of the market up. So we would expect frequency response markets to grow because of that. Um, the size of your largest loss, if that is larger, then you would expect your response requirements to go up. 
Um, the number of individ individual loss risks, if there are more of them, and so National Grid is carrying a greater risk that at any point in time, one of these events could occur, then you would also expect your response holding to go up because you might need to make sure it can withstand multiple losses. However, there are other things that bring that size down. How fast is your response? The faster your response, the smaller the size of the market that's required. Um, and uh, the other big one that some people may have seen recently, National Grid released their um, frequency risk and control report talking about how they're going to manage these frequency risks. And if, as an industry, National Grid and um, collaboration with Ofgem, agree that some of these risks, an 1800 megawatt loss of a nuclear site, for example, do not need to be covered because the cost of covering it outweighs um, uh, 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 the risk of it actually occurring, then that reduces your market size as well. So it's these things constantly playing uh, uh, together to work out what your market size is. That's why I was saying, had we stuck with FFR, the market size would have been massive. You know, to cater for the reduced amount of inertia, you'd um, end up in a world where you're almost procuring more FFR than it's physically possible to procure on the system. So you go to faster products, actually that reduces the requirement considerably. Brilliant. Well, I'm going to squeeze one last question in, but I'm sure that any that haven't been answered, you'd be happy to answer afterwards. We can put something up on current, finishing off any questions that <laughs> people have. Um, so but as we're kind of about half an hour now, Last one from Steve Broderick, which is, what is the long-term future of DR, DM, DC, given the fact that millions of EVs from circa 2025 onwards may be controlled remotely? Will their presence undercut income stacks now that uh, now assumed available? Long one for me to finish on. And a very popular question around what happens when you have millions of EVs um, yes. out there? Does it just undermine everything? Um, there's a few challenges here. Um, I'm sure anybody who's interacted with the, you know, any, anybody in the industry, be it regulation, be it national grid, um, be it TOs, DNAs, whatever it may be, will note that this industry was designed for a handful of large incumbents and all of the regulation and all of the systems that are in place were designed for that. And lots of hard work has been put in. Great moves have been made to get to a position where we can probably now handle, you know, a, a couple of hundred sites connected to these systems and delivering these services that is more than an order of magnitude away from what we would have to do to get this functioning with millions of EVs. Do I believe in the long term there is a time when this could be done? Yes. Um, do I believe it's technically possible? Yes. Do I believe it will happen anytime soon? Um, no, which always makes me feel like I'm ending on a pessimistic note. Absolutely, they could do it. The amount of effort required to do it, the amount of system changes that would need to occur, even things like having um, 20 hertz metering down at every single um, EV level to be able to confirm that they are actually responding is colossal and should not be underestimated. And you'll also get to a point where you say, actually, the value proposition is just no longer here for the EV owner because there are so many people in the chain and so many system changes that need to be um, made that an EV owner is suddenly getting a pound or a couple of pounds for having their vehicle plugged in delivering frequency response services. Um, actually, you're better off just going with economies of scale and using a large asset to do it. Good question to end on then, and one that has, as you said, been very much asked and, and very much of interest to many people. Thank you so much for you know coming on and giving your insight into this. Um, I've had great engagement, and clearly people have been really interested to hear what you have to say. Um, our next one in the current briefing series will be happening soon and keep an eye out on the current website for more details on that. Once again, thank you, Mike. Um, and thank you to everyone who has joined in today and asked questions. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you.